Uh, I will say weirdly enough, and I know a lot of you pre-meds are working so hard right now, it felt like being pre-med was harder than med school. I genuinely feel like you have a lot more going on. There's a lot more at stake. You don't know if you're going to get into med school. So just know that if you feel like you're working so hard and you're burning out, that sometimes is normal. You know, the people that you're currently seeing on your screen, many of you probably follow them on social media. I'm going to get to starting to introduce them. And I'm going to ask each one individually to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their journey into becoming a, a, a medical student, where they're at right now in their journey, and then we'll get started with questions. So I'm going to start with Sana. I see you first. Uh, just introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Uh, my name is Sana. I am a first year medical student at the UC Irvine School of Medicine. And a little story, little backstory about me. I went to the University of Southern California, so USC, for undergrad, took one gap year where I worked as an MA and barista, and uh, got into UCI. And I love it here. So I'm really excited to share whatever I can to help you guys out. Great. Thanks so much for being here. Next, I see Misha. Hi guys, I'm so excited to be here um, and see all of your beautiful faces. Um, I'm Misha. I am a first year medical student over at Kansas City University. Um, a little backstory about me, I went to Florida Atlantic University, uh, which is in South Florida. And I also took a gap year where I worked as a medical assistant. And the following cycle, I got accepted into medical school and we're almost done with the first year, which is insane. Great, thanks so much for joining as well. Megan, you're next. Hey everyone, I'm very excited to be here just like everyone else. I am a first year. Um, I go to Texas Tech Med School, but I went to UT Austin for undergrad. So I'm excited to be repping Texas here. Um, I didn't take a gap year. I just graduated less than a year ago, uh, but I did a lot, of, a lot of mentoring in my undergrad experience. So being part of this is something I'm really excited to. Oh, I see someone in the chat. Hook them. Yeah. But yeah, this is really exciting for me. Great, and our last panelist here is Clara. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all. Excited to be here, just like all the other panelists. I'm currently a fourth year medical student at Case Western in Ohio, but I'm technically on a gap year. Instead of taking gap year before med school, I'm taking one now in between my third and fourth year of med school working at a tech company. And for undergrad, I went to University of Miami in Florida and excited to be here. Sorry, I was on mute. So there we have our panelists. And for the next hour, they're going to be answering your questions directly. I'm going to be helping to moderate. So I'm going to be looking in the Q&A and asking individual questions to individual panelists. But for those who aren't answering at the time, they're going to be answering your questions via the Q&A portion as well. So you can continue asking. We're going to try to get through as many as we possibly can. Um, the first question, it's actually more of a, uh, a general question um, for, I'm going to ask Clara first. The question is really about differentiating yourself because getting into medical school is so competitive and there's so many people who apply. So my question is, was there something on your application that feel like made you sort of stand out or something that you tried to emphasize when you were applying and when you were interviewing? Definitely. I think it's hard. You know, so many people are applying to med school. So many people are doing the similar checkbox, you know, activities like research, volunteering. So I think the way to stand out is just do what you're passionate about. It doesn't need to be what everyone else is doing and it shouldn't be, you know, what everyone else is doing or what you think med school admissions would want. Just do what you're passionate about and that's what will help you stand out. So for me, Specifically, I was really interested in business, learning more about healthcare startups, and I was involved in a student organization that was more towards, you know, business students, um, finance and consulting, but I also had several other experiences along the business route, but I combined that and, you know, talked about why I thought it was important to have this business background as a future physician, so I feel like that really helped me stand out because it was also unique to me. I was passionate about it um, and yeah. Great, that's an awesome answer. And so I'm seeing something in the Q&A come up a few times and, and it's something that I wanna emphasize during today's session, it's about balance. What does a typical day look like? How do you balance the requirements of medical school? And also maybe even taking it back a step and saying, well, when you're a pre-med and you have so many different things to do, how do you balance 
your life, your studying, your extracurriculars, and your sort of having a life outside of it too. So Sana, this question is going to be for you. First, sort of how did you balance that when you were a pre-med? And then now, what does a day in the life look like? Yeah, uh, I will say weirdly enough, and I know a lot of you pre-meds are working so hard right now, it felt like being pre-med was harder than med school. I genuinely feel like you have a lot more going on. There's a lot more at stake. You don't know if you're going to get into med school. So just know that if you feel like you're working so hard and you're burning out, that sometimes is normal. And I'm sorry you're going through that, but it might get better on the other side um, of the admissions game. And yeah, when I was a pre-med, I was an RA. So a lot of my work just involved like kind of being in my room, being accessible to the students who are on my floor. So while I was doing that, I kind of multitask a lot. I think that's the way I, that's how I got away with a lot of things um, is just multitasking while I was in other extracurriculars. But I guess the biggest advice I'd have for all of the work that goes on when you're a pre-med is pick things you're truly passionate about. Those are the things that come most easily to you. Um, they seem like less work when you're actually doing it. And I know that a lot of you are doing so many things in undergrad. Just remember that there's only so many things you can talk about when you apply to medical school. So I ended up not talking about two or three clubs in any of my med school interviews or essays. And I think that honestly, if I didn't enjoy those clubs, I shouldn't have done it. And that would have meant an extra hour of sleep for me or an extra amount of time to watch TV or read a book. Um, now that I'm in med school, I feel like I have a way better grasp of work-life balance. I play pickleball all the time. I think like making time for exercise, cooking every single day. Um, I have a cat. And so I think just prioritizing those sorts of little things that make life fun are really important. And that's also important in choosing a school that emphasizes that high quality of life for students. Great answer. And again, everybody, for the questions that you're asking, if you're asking in the chat and you're accidentally sending it to host and panelists, not everyone's going to be able to see it. So make sure you're sending it to like everyone, um, but also make sure they're going in the Q&A so that we can answer them afterwards as well. The next question I have is for Misha, and it's going to be a little bit about gap years. So I see this question pop up and um, you mentioned that you had taken a gap year. So what was your thought process around wanting to take one or what was your thought process around the importance of a gap year for your application and what would you recommend to students who are thinking about taking a gap year yeah that's a great question this is like my favorite question ever because i think gap years are probably the best thing that you can do not just for yourself but and for your application but just to develop you as a person overall in my gap year i was a medical assistant right so i got a lot of work experience and I will say getting clinical experience or work experience in general, that's something that you can't learn in a classroom. And it's really going to stand out when you start applying to medical school, when you start going into interviews. Um, pretty much, I think in, my God, I think in almost every interview that I had, they talked about my clinical experience. And I will say going forward into medical school, when you have to do clinical skills and clinical assessments and physical exams, those skills that you learn within your gap year, if you do decide to do clinical experience like I did, are going to be key. Like that is going to make you stand out from the rest of your class. Also in general, like I had mentioned previously, it just, it makes you more of an adult, right? Because you're going into medical school, you guys are gonna become physicians. Like this is an amazing step that you guys are taking towards your career. And, um, you know, we got to mature up a little bit. So if you are thinking about taking a gap year, I always recommend it. I think we're so focused on like, I'm on this timeline, right? I have to get into medical school by the time I'm 21. I have to graduate by the time I'm 25. I have to become a, like, there is no timeline at all. Your journey is your journey. I have friends in medical. Let me tell you guys, I'm 24 years old. I'm probably one of the youngest people in my class. My friends are like 28, 29, 35, right? They've had years of career experience and lives before medical school. There is no um, one set schedule, right? There is no schedule for you to get into medical school. So if you're thinking about taking a gap year, I think it's one of the best things that you guys can do for yourselves. I love it. Yeah, everyone has their own timeline. I feel like oftentimes we're trying to rush to get to the next level from being in high school to college to medical school to residency to fellowship to being in attending and it's this lifelong journey really so it's important to kind of slow down and make sure every time every step along the way you're enjoying the process. 
Um, so I love that answer. And Megan, the next question is going to be for you a little bit about, um, it's something that I, I saw pop up a few times, and it's about shadowing and really getting that sort of experience of seeing what it's like to, to be surrounded by doctors and the healthcare environment. So what was your experience like either looking for shadowing or clinical experiences? And what advice would you give to students who, who really want to see more of what being a doctor is like? Okay, so shadowing, I remember, used to be so daunting as a pre-med, and honestly, it still kind of is as a med student, just because as someone training to be a physician, you know that you're not there, you're you're not there yet. You don't have an MD. So you don't exactly have as many capabilities as a medical doctor would or a physician. And so you always kind of feel smaller whenever um, you're shadowing or looking for shadowing. But in my experience, I really enjoyed the experiences that I had, although I was a little uh, nervous going into it because I'm like, what if I shadow for the first time and I find out that I actually don't like medicine and I'm going to quit, you know, so it's always something like that, like you're worried that something going to draw you away from medicine, but there's also, you know, something that will draw you towards medicine and that's what I got from my first shadowing experience. Um, he was a really good teacher and he taught me so much that it drew me so much closer to medicine. And that physician that I shadowed was actually like my next door neighbor's relative's doctor. And so I feel like that highlighted a lot about how much you kind of have to network in medicine. I think it's getting more and more important as the time goes by, like just making connections and finding opportunities through those connections. No, that's great. Um, and I hope I'm not frozen. I, I might be frozen, but I hope I'm not. Um, the next question is going to be for Clara, and it's a little bit more about sort of that experience before applying and getting clinical experience and sort of seeing what medical school is going to be like, seeing what residency is going to be like. How did you go about deciding that, you know, this is something that you want to do? What were some of your experiences that showed that? Definitely. I would say there's a lot of things that I didn't know before. I started medical school and it's really hard. I think now with now that social media is a lot bigger, people post day in my life as a resident or a medical student, it makes it more, you know, it makes it easier for pre-meds to see maybe what it's like to be a resident and medical student and the realities, both the pros and cons. So for me, I feel like the way I went about that was shadowing, like um, some of the other panelists have said, and also talking to current medical students, talking to physicians who I shadowed, getting their take as well. And I think also for me, it wasn't necessarily just being a physician. For me, it was like bigger picture. I wanted to be part of improving our healthcare system. And for me, and I also wanted to have direct patient interactions. Um, I think one of my volunteer experiences also helped me realize this when I volunteered at a student health clinic, interacting directly with patients and volunteering as a hospice. I enjoyed being in the hospital. I enjoyed talking to patients. So both the combination of the patient interaction and wanting to improve our healthcare system in a bigger uh, capacity was my motivation. I love it. I love that. Yeah. And so we talked a little bit about that, but also there are these, like, we, we talked a little bit about check boxes and some of the deans, you know, they, they mentioned that it's, it's important not to do your application through check boxes, right? You should do things that you're passionate about. And one of the things that I feel like students don't often like to do is, or maybe some do, but research, and they feel like research is just like really you know, daunting thing. So Sana, I'm going to ask you, did you do research? And if you did, what was it about? Or how did you convey it? And if you didn't, how do you feel like that was, you know, taken on your application? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that's one of the biggest anxieties a lot of pre-meds have about medical school apps because research is daunting. And even as a medical student doing research, I barely know what's going on. Um, so it is a confusing process and it is a hard field to tap into. I did have research. I actually was a transfer student. So I went to the University of Michigan for a year and a half and then I transferred to USC. Um, and so when I got into Michigan, I immediately joined a research program there and I did a little bit of research. And actually that's one of those things I didn't even put on my application. Um, and that's just to show that like if something is not meaningful to you, you don't need to put it on your application. And then when I went to USC, I joined joined a research lab uh, regarding pancreatic cancer and essentially building organoids, which are 3D models of tumors, putting a little bit of chemotherapy into it and seeing how those 3D models of tumors would react. Uh, and 
the reason that medical that research experience was so impactful for me was because I had a good mentor and that's something that I will tell every single person who wants to go into research do not have a scarcity mindset don't say yes to every opportunity just because you think another one is not going to come up I sent so many cold emails I asked for a 10 minute phone call with every physician I emailed and I made sure I was genuinely interested in their project when I got on their on a call with them I made sure that they were genuinely interested in mentoring me and I asked what they could bring to the table to help me out and my specific mentor I told him I want to make sure I can present something at a conference I want to make sure I can get involved with writing a manuscript and he was able to throughout my two years there guide me through the process and write me a great letter of recommendation so though I didn't even talk about research very much in my interviews, just because it didn't come up very much, I was super passionate about it. And I think I got a great letter of rec and experience from it. Yeah. And being able to talk passionately about your experiences is such a critical piece of it, because it's not just about doing things. It's about conveying what that meant to you and, and what you learned from it. And you touched on something else as well, which is letters of recommendation. So I'm going to ask Megan, Megan, when you were applying, how did you go about collecting letters of recommendation? Who did you ask? You know, how did you ask? And then, you know, what advice would you give for someone who, you know, maybe sitting here with no letters of recommendation, but wanting to apply in the next year or two? And, you know, what would you tell them about getting letters of rec? This was also something that I struggled a lot with um, because I went to a really large undergrad. And so, you know, starting out in biology and chemistry, there's like 500 other students. And I wasn't in office hours all the time because genuinely there was like 50 kids that went to office hours and that just wasn't the environment that worked for me. And so I mainly looked into research mentors that I had. So it's like what Sana said, if you're in a research lab or doing research, make sure to like do well there, like show that you have a good work ethic and that you're efficient uh, and really build your relationship with the people in that lab. So that's one way that you could find a letter of rec. Another way that I got a letter of rec was I reached out to one of the physicians that I shadowed. So if you do get really close with the physicians you shadow and you build a relationship with them over time, then this is something that you can do. The physician that I shadowed, he was in my hometown. And so whenever I would visit during like spring break or winter break, I would be like, hey, can I stop by the clinic and just say, hey, um, and he would just let me sh shadow him, follow him around for like an hour or two there. Um, and we'd just catch up. So that was kind of also a long term relationship that I um, that I maintained over time. Um, other than that, then you kind of want to really start to focus on finding letters of recommendation from professors that you're taking upper level classes in, like towards the latter part of your college career, because those classes are smaller. And I think it's easier to really showcase your interest in that class or any curiosity. So I was in a data science class. I took a lot of like stats and CS courses. And I would show up to the office hours because if you guys know, coding is very hard. Um, I don't know if anyone has experience with that in the audience, but it's really hard. And so um, you have to go to office hours a lot for that. And so my professor obviously like knew me because I would participate in class over Zoom, but I would also go to office hours. And eventually I emailed her to ask her about meeting to talk about her career path. Um, and I kind of expressed just interest in the intersection between data science and medicine because you know I was pre-med so I wanted to kind of make it obvious that I was interested in something but I didn't want to just like pretend that I was interested in something so I wanted something genuine to actually meet with her about um, so I think I did that like once or twice and kind of just continued being a good student in her class and then eventually I asked her for a letter of rec and I think depending on the nature of your relationship you can ask over email or in person I think I asked over email if like I genuinely couldn't reach the person that I was asking because um, I also asked a high school teacher that I had and that was like a very long term good relationship that I had so um, I don't think you have to ask in person or request a letter in person. Um, but yeah, those are just some ways that I got my letters. Got it. Got it. That's really helpful to hear because, you know, building longitudinal relationships and getting a letter is great, but it's not always possible for everybody. So if possible, that's great. But otherwise, you know, there are other people who can write letters of rec and it's important to give your letter writers a little bit of time to, to get that done. You don't want to tell them like last minute, like, hey, I need this, you know, next week, but give them some time. Um, and it's something that's really helpful and really makes a difference, it seems, when you're applying. Um, I have a question for you, Misha, that's um, that would be next. 
And it's a little bit about what I would say is one of the more daunting parts of applying. I remember I struggled with this and it has to do with the personal statement. So when you were applying, right, how did you get across your message in pretty much like one page in your personal statement? And, and how did you try to stand out with that? Yeah, um, so this, I mean, I feel like personal statement is probably one of the most daunting things for all pre-meds because like, what do I write about, right? I talked about everything. Um, I would focus on something personal within your life that's not related to the stats, like your research, your shadowing hours, your um, whatever clubs that you were in, unless there was something that was really meaningful for you, at least the approach that I took, um, for my personal statement was kind of talking about my first spark, my first interest in medicine. And, um, just a little quick backstory for you guys. My grandpa was a physician in Iran. And so I actually had the opportunity to actually go around and, you know, see patients and kind of shadow him in his workplace um, when I was young. So that was kind of like my first exposure to medicine and what really sparked my interest and my love for the field. So that's something that I really focused on. I wanted to get my, whoever was reading my personal statement, I wanted them to be connected to me and my story as far as how I fell in love with medicine and why that made me want to become a doctor. So uh, the personal statement, I think a really great step is to get personal with it go and really reflect on why do you want to become a physician? Because everybody has a different and unique story. You know, um, maybe, maybe it didn't start for you until you were in college and you got some clinical experience, or maybe you were like me and you got your first exposure to medicine really early. I think the best thing is to, again, focus on your why. Like, why do you want to become a doctor? It's not because you want to help people, right? We all say, oh, we want to help people, but you can help people in so many ways. You really, and your personal statement, I think focus on why medicine, why a doctor? And um, again, like for me, I just love getting personal with it and giving people a glimpse into my past, something that wasn't on my resume at all, right? So um, I think those are the steps that I took and got me into a couple of medical schools. <laughs> nice. And, and what you said about not just rehashing your personal, but your CV essentially and your activities in your personal statement. It's so true because like we heard from the deans, you know, an hour or so ago that, you know, you want to bring a fresh perspective from your, from your CV, essentially, it shouldn't just be rewording of what you've done. It should be about how you made the decision really and what drives you. Um, so really great answer. And to keep going through questions, then the next one's going to be for Clara, and it's a question about leadership. You know, some people have asked about that, and the deans even talked about it a little bit earlier, but what were some of the ways that you expressed your leadership qualities, your abilities to do sort of projects and, and push teams forward? Because as a physician, you're the leader of the healthcare team. So how did you convey your leadership experience uh, to, you know, to medical school admissions committees? Definitely. I would say my main involvement that I used to demonstrate leadership was my involvement in the pre uh, consulting organization I was a part of. I joined my freshman year just as a member, and then I joined the executive board and also became one of the co-chairs of that organization my junior and senior year. So I used that experience to show not only my leadership, you know, emphasizing how much we grew, what I was able to do during my four years. And also, I think it's important to show, you know, you're committed and being involved in an activity for a long period of time, as opposed to, you know, switching between different activities, like every couple months or every year. So I think showing that long-term involvement in addition to the leadership really helped. And I used that um, experience as an example for leadership. Great. Um, and I'm seeing a question in the chat here in the Q&A about, uh, about the MCAT. And we just heard a whole hour long session about the MCAT and how important it is because it really is sort of the main foundations of your application. So someone asks a question about that and I'm gonna direct it to Sana. And the question is, what's your biggest advice for preparing for the MCAT? It is an overwhelming process. You know, the score does really matter. It's one of the foundations. How did you prepare for the MCAT and what advice would you give specifically for that? Yeah, great question. Uh, so first thing with the MCAT is deciding when you're going to take it. And that requires understanding when you're going to apply. So when 
I was taking the MCAT. I took it right after my junior year of college. So I studied from May to August and I took it in August. I got to go through senior year. Uh, I'm like forgetting the app cycle, write all my essays, apply. And that meant I took a gap year before medical school. Um, and I took two months at first and then I had to push back by one month because I just thought I needed more time. Generally, some advice I would give for the MCAT is really definitely use the AAMC materials. I know that the MCAT is a big investment, uh, but those are the materials that you 100% should invest in because it's stuff directly from the people who make the exam. And I would really highly recommend um, looking for free re resources at the same time. So there is Anki, which you can do for psych and Soch, which I think is the greatest use of Anki for the MCAT. And um, I would say really don't focus all your time on review. I really struggled to like read a book and try to just absorb and via osmosis, just like take in all that information. So I wish I did a little bit of review and then jumped into practice questions. And every time I didn't know something on a practice question, I'm like, look, here is a gap in my knowledge. And now I'm gonna go look for a book or a video that can answer my question. Um, and I think that happens a lot in medical school too. It's a lot less about like, let me read through every single book. It's more like, let me put my brain to work, try to answer questions and learn things in the process. Um, and then the last piece of advice I'll give about the MCAT is really, really try to simulate your MCAT test taking environment. I wore the same sweater every single time I took the MCAT. I listened to the same song in the car right before I took every single practice MCAT. I ate the same exact snacks. And I think when I got to my MCAT testing site, I was like locked in because I knew exactly what to expect. So I would recommend all of that. That's awesome. Yeah, the MCAT is just such an important piece. But again, it's possible to retake it if needed. And, you know, there are ways to, there are strategies and ways to really give yourself the best chance possible. We heard all about that in the last hour. So that's a great answer. And I just want to go quickly back um, about the leadership question we were talking about a little bit and ask Claire about it because Claire, you've gone through medical school now and you've, you know, you've seen what that process is like. So you've been a pre-med, now you've been a medical student for several years. How do you handle the workload? How do you, how do you develop yourself as a leader during your time in medical school and now getting ready to apply to residency in some time? Like how have you grown during medical school? I definitely want to go back to what Misha was saying about taking gap years, you know, it helps you mature. I 100% think I've matured so much in medical school from my first to now being a basically fourth year medical student. I think there's so many misconceptions that I might have had or just like false assumptions thinking that med school was going to be really you know, I'm not going to have time for friends and family and hobbies. And that's totally not the case as well either. Like, I feel like I've gotten really close with my med school friends. We have social events every weekend, obviously a lot of studying as well. And I think adjusting to a new way to study was something I had to figure out during my first year of medical school, because you do learn a lot more at a short amount of time um, compared to being a pre-medical student. But I think an important thing too is, you know, prioritizing. Sometimes, yeah, you might not if you're prioritizing, you know, only studying, then of course you're not going to have time, you know, to spend with your friends or go work out. But if you prioritize that and, you know, realize that like taking an hour break from studying sometimes is going to be more productive than, um, than just like trying to study all day because then you'll feel burnt out. So I think a lot of that was kind of trial and error of what schedule works for me, what routine. Um, but I definitely think you learn that quickly and it's not something that like, if I can do it, you all can do it as well. So um, it's definitely more manageable than you might think. For sure, for sure. Thank you so much for that answer. And someone asked in the Q&A as well, a question directed towards Misha. So I'm gonna give her the chance to answer too. And it's really about a question uh, about a, a student who's really interested in the DO process. And any advice to develop an application that really is tailored towards DO schools? And what's the difference really between MD and DO schools, if any? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I just quick before I start answering that question, why I chose DO, I am really interested in internal medicine and potentially sports medicine in the future. So the only difference between an MD and a DO, we have the same exact training DOs just have additional training in another field called osteopathic manipulative therapy. 
And essentially, if you guys are interested in what that is, I always explain it like this when I'm talking to anybody or like my simulated patients and OSCEs and we have to explain what OMT is. Your body has the power to heal itself, right? You like when you cut yourself, when you get a paper cut, right? You heal on your own. You don't have to do anything for it. Essentially, OMT in more chronic like musculoskeletal problems or um, like lymphatic drainage problems that a patient might have. We as physicians use your own body and manipulate it in a certain way so it can help itself heal. And um, if you're really interested in osteopathic manipulative therapy or kind of learning about that field more, I would highly recommend shadowing a DO. And if you're deciding to apply to DO schools, when you are applying, apply and talk about DO because a lot of the secondary applications will ask why DO, right? Like why medicine and why DO specifically? Really understand what osteopathic medicine is. It's medicine, it's MD medicine with an additional training of osteopathic manipulative therapy. So it's not like sometimes when I do some reviews of patients' um, secondary essays, I see that they're kind of off on what OMT is and osteopathic medicine is. So if you are interested in going to the field, again, shadow a DO, reach out to DO students and see what the vibe is, what is osteopathic medicine, and um, when you can really articulate why you want to go into this field, I think you're much more likely to get acceptances into DO programs as well. Fantastic answer. That was really helpful in terms of clarifying as well. And that really addresses that student's question. So thank you so much for that. Um, another question here as well, I'm going to ask Megan. Megan, you're a first year medical student, but you know, you do have to start thinking about what specialty you want to go into. And is there some way that you would recommend for pre-meds to kind of think about what they're interested in specifically with, within medicine? Is that something that somebody needs to know before applying, or is it something that you develop during the course of your medical school studies? Yes, so that is also another thing that a lot of first years kind of have feel pressure on. Um, me and a lot of my friends are also kind of the same way where we're like, I don't know how I'm supposed to know what specialty I wanna do because we're just doing classroom learning right now. We're not doing rotations in the hospital. And so, yeah, it is definitely a struggle, but I think what really helps to figure out what specialty you might be interested in as a pre-med is shadowing whatever doctor in that specialty. And sometimes, you know, you don't even think that you'd be interested in it, but whenever you shadow, it's like, I really liked this doctor, maybe I'll kind of give this specialty a shot. Um, so whenever it comes to declaring what specialty you want or like going into medical school with an idea, you definitely don't have to know anything at all um, about what you want to do as a physician in the future. I've heard of a lot of people who will like just switch up specialties at the end of their third year, which is like, which is crazy because, you know, you apply to residency in your fourth year. So um, all this to say, like a lot of people pivot in the last year before applying to residency. And so I feel like it's a very, something very fluid, like people change their minds a lot. And um, depending on who you are, you kind of, you might want to have it decided early on and then you can work on research, but if not, then that's okay too. Um, and if you kind of have an idea of what you want to do, what you can do as a pre-med is engage in research related to that specialty or engage in volunteering in that specialty. So for example, if I was interested in psychiatry, I might shadow psychiatrists. I might start a mental health initiative at my undergrad campus, things like that. And it kind of builds a narrative in your application whenever you do decide to go to medical school. And it's definitely no pressure at all to like stick with that too, you know, <laughs> like as a pre-med, everyone knows that if, you know, you're very early in the career path. And once you start medical school, your interests may very well change. Um, there are people who go in wanting to do like peds and then they switch to surgery or there are people who go in wanting to do surgery and they switch to peds. So I think it's, you know, it depends on who you are and a lot of things can happen. So um, it's good to keep your mind open. And if you're interested in something, then pursue it, explore it. And if that's not the case, then you move on to the next specialty. <laughs> yeah, great answer. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for that. And I have a question here now for Sana, and it's going to be a question about choosing a major as an undergraduate. So 
Is there a major that you think is like the most helpful for somebody to major in? Can somebody major in anything? What was your major and how did you decide on that? Yeah, you can major in absolutely anything. And I have classmates who majored in arts, in comp sci, in bio, in history, whatever it might be. If anything, having a quote unquote unique major may, may make you a more unique applicant. So truly do whatever makes you happy. Um, I think the my major was public health or it was specifically health promotion and disease prevention uh, at USC. And I absolutely loved it because it had a more public health focus. And we had some really cool classes we could take like Eastern medicine um, and global health. And that's specifically why I chose my major. Um, in addition to that, I think a, the reason a lot of people pick those science majors like public health, like bio, like neuroscience is because your prerequisites are kind of included in it. Like for medical school, you need to take bio one and bio two. And in a biology degree, you also need to take bio one and bio two. So I think it does make it a little easier to plan. However, I think it's very manageable, especially with how easy it is to get a major and a minor nowadays to do a completely separate major like business and find time to get all of your prerequisites in throughout all four years of undergraduate. I think all it requires is talking to someone, making a plan ahead of time and making sure you know how to fit all of your prereqs in. Um, but yeah, I have a great example. Actually, I have a classmate who did computer science in his undergrad and then worked as a computer scientist for two years during his gap year. And he honestly was able to make a lot of money, save up for medical school and is now really interested in radiology, which has a lot of applications to comp sci. So do whatever makes you happy. Um, and yeah, I actually just don't think majors are a super big deal and will not determine whether or not you get into medical school. Right, because as long as you're really meeting the requirements for those science courses and the courses that are required, you know, like you said, do what you love. It is still college. It's still an opportunity to learn. So that's that's awesome. Um, and I see a question directly for Clara, which is kind of about your work-life balance a little bit. You've, you know, clearly the medical school curriculum is difficult. It's rigorous. There's a lot that you have to do. So outside of it, you know, how do you, how do you have hobbies? How are you doing publications and posters and doing, having work experience? How do you balance it all? Yeah, it's definitely one thing, like I was saying earlier, you definitely have time for your friends and hobbies, but there are other times, like, especially during third year where you really barely have time to get enough sleep because as soon as you come back from the hospital you have to study for exams which are graded and actually at least at my school are graded and it has an impact on our residency application so it's really hard to do that and make sure you have all your research going especially if you want to apply to competitive specialties it can be honestly a lot to balance all this as a medical student and that's why many of my classmates and around like a third or fourth of my classmates took gap years as well. Um, many of them doing research because they wanted to be more competitive for specialties that they're applying to. So taking that extra year kind of helps with trying to figure and balance out everything. And for me, I definitely couldn't work full-time while being a medical student. And for me, I wanted to get some full-time work experience to help me with opportunities in the future during residency. So I personally decided to take the year off and it's been great to work, also have time for my hobbies a little bit more, um, but definitely fourth year of medical school as well. It's going to be a lot of free time after submitting applications. So basically, I'm really excited for that. Yeah, that second half of fourth year is definitely like a really good time where you're sort of, you've already finished up all of your application for residency, you've matched and, and you have a chance to sort of coast a little bit more, which is great. Um, thanks so much for that answer. And the next question is going to be for Megan. And remember, everyone, you're seeing the questions in the q a you know you're getting the answers there and we're going to try to get to as many as possible so the question for megan is about how you chose your medical school um there are a lot of medical schools out there um there's a lot that you can decide on applying to or not you know you have to decide and make a list for yourself and ultimately you know if you have multiple acceptances you have to choose one what was it about your medical school that st stood out for you and, and how did you overall go about making your your school list Okay, so I think my experience might be different from a lot of medical students just because I'm a Texas applicant. So for those who don't know, there's there's like three application services. There's a DO one that's like AA comas and then AMCAS and TMDSAS. So 
with the Texas Application Service, there's like 15-ish medical schools in Texas, and it's just like a checklist, and you just check which ones you want to apply to, and it's a flat fee of like $200. Maybe it's more now, but it was $200 whenever I applied. And so that's how I made my school list. I picked a few out-of-state schools to apply to that were like kind of in the range of my MCAT, but in general, they were schools that like I would go to despite the really high tuition. Um, and for those who don't know, Texas has very, very cheap medical school tuition. So it's like, it would have to be a really awesome out-of-state school for me to pick and go into more debt <laughs> for versus a Texas medical school with like relatively cheap tuition. And so I think I did like five out of state schools and it's probably a lot of schools that y'all would recognize. So like, I think I did like Dartmouth, Michigan, Emory, Tulane, like just like, like very name brand schools, but I didn't interview any of them. So I'll talk about the Texas ones. So Texas, one of the really big factors um, that I and a lot of people I know take into account for medical school is where it is like location. So if you want to be close to your family, then that's a factor that you want to take into account. Or if you want to be close to your friends or significant other, that's something that you want to take into account. Um, personally, for my school, I went here because like, I mean, they were the ones who wanted me. They like, honestly, the reality of a lot of medical school decisions is like, who wants you? And I don't think a lot of people can be picky. I personally didn't have the privilege of being picky with medical school. So I'm here because um, they wanted me and I'm going here because they want me and I want to become a doctor and this is how I'm going to become a doctor. Um, but some really great things about my school that I think everyone should take into account is like the pass fail curriculum. So you want to go to a medical school or like you don't want to, but some schools have a pass fail curriculum. So that's where you're tests are like you either pass or you fail some schools have like kind of a ranking system so you can pass high pass honor high honors for each exam and then some schools just have like straight numbers um which can kind of be scary because it's like you know it's like college all over again high school all over again where it's like an exact number that measures you but for me it's just pass or fail so it takes a lot of pressure off of me because I don't have to study so hard because if if I was aiming for 100 every time I took an exam, I think I'd be studying way more than I am now, and I wouldn't have as much free time as I do. Um, another thing is like mandatory attendance versus asynchronous lectures. Um, there's also something that uh, I think is really important, and I think a lot of pre-meds don't know about, is how much time you get for your step dedicated. So um, my boyfriend's school, they have like a couple weeks less than my school for dedicated, and so if you don't have as many weeks, then you might not feel as ready for step. So depending on, you know, if that matters to you, then that's something you can take into account. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of as many factors as I can, because I definitely didn't know about this until I started medical school. Um, for those who know what specialty you want to go into, I think it's important to go to a school that has a home program or a very strong program there. So for me right now, I'm interested in ENT and my school has an ENT program, which is great. So I can like network with the residents there. But some people interested in ENT, their schools don't have a home program. So like they don't really have access to ENTs <laughs> to shadow or to do research with. So that's something that I don't see that's talked about a lot um, in terms of like, you know, a factor, an important factor in deciding your medical school. So um, I think if I think of anything, I might put it in the chat, but those are kind of what comes to mind right now. Right. And and having that home program that you can network with and, and you can go shadow when you're a medical student, that is really helpful. So great point about that. Um, and really this process is just so competitive for everybody that all it takes though is one medical school to accept you, one medical school to believe that you can be a physician. And that's really all it takes. So you know people say apply broadly and you know if you need to if you need to apply again, that's okay as well. Um, but you can become a physician if you put your mind to it. Um, the next question is for Misha, and it's about sort of mistakes that people make along the way. Um, was there, you know, something that you feel like you could have done differently in, in your, you know, process of applying to medical school? Was there a mistake that you made or what mistakes do you see people making that you would want to tell people in advance, you know, hey, you know, this is something that you can do to avoid any issues in your application as well? Ooh. Great question because I made multiple mistakes. <laughs> I actually, fun fact, had to apply to medical school twice. 
Um, I did not get into medical school my first round. So I learned from my mistakes. And personally, the mistakes that I make, and I see a lot of pre-made meds make, are, I'll give you three. One big one, they apply with no clinical experience. Unfortunately, medical school has gotten so competitive to the point where you do need to get some type of clinical experience now. Um, and I didn't know that at the time. Not only do you want to have that on your application, but like I had mentioned previously in my whole gap year spiel, it's a great thing to get. It's just really going to reemphasize why you want to be a doctor. And it's going to bring that spark back because sometimes I feel like when we're in the classroom 24 seven and you're taking organic chemistry and biochemistry and you're like, why am I doing this? And it's taking all these hard classes. You kind of forget the why. So clinical experience is a great thing and I, you need it on your medical school application. Number two actually has to do with secondary essays. And um, I think I personally, when I was applying the first time in medical school, I, I don't have any family in the United States who are physicians. Um, so I was kind of going into this application process blind. I didn't have um, amazing resources like med school coach here. I didn't know about anything. Um, so I was just kind of you know, I thought it was like a CV and a resume. And one thing when you're approaching secondary essays is you need to make it a story. You want to keep your reader engaged and you want to give them a story about that experience that you've had, right? You want to make it into a narrative and something that's going to make your application stand out. And I didn't do that. My secondary essays the first time around were like, I I did research for four years about retinal blastomas and da, 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 and this, and it was just like a, I was writing a resume, right? Um, so I think that was a, a really big downfall. And actually one of the schools that I had applied to, um, they were open to uh, having actually one of the admissions committees like telling me why they didn't accept me. And one big thing was my writing. So that was something that I spent my gap year improving and um, got me a couple of like, medical school acceptances the following. And I think the third biggest thing is applying. Like just what time do you apply? I also applied late. Um, and I didn't know that there was, you know, it's better to apply early because there are less seats taken. So just having your application ready and filled and just ready to submit as soon as possible is super important because the later that you apply in the application cycle, the less your chances become um, just because there are already multiple seats being filled. So I think those are the three biggest mistakes that I see most pre-meds make and I made on my first application cycle. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's really helpful to hear from from you all who have gone through the process and, and you've you know had your own journeys and for somebody who you know is kind of sitting here today watching and still has this whole process in front of them being able to avoid those same mistakes could be so helpful so thank you so much for sharing that something you mentioned as well was the importance of having somebody sort of look over your uh, you know your essays your application or somebody who can help with the timing and things like that. So having somebody on your side is just such a beneficial thing, whether that's somebody you find online or a mentor that you have from your undergrad institution, or you know, obviously we've talked about it here with advisors for med school coach or things like that, but just having somebody who can be with you every step of the way is just so valuable. Um, and really you're trying to maximize your chances here. So that's a great answer. And the next one I see is for Sano, who has been answering questions about this actually in the chat, but it's about the interview process. There are different kinds of interviews. It's there's, you know, there's standard interviews, there's MMIs. What was your interview process like for medical school? What are the different types of interview formats and how would you suggest people prepare for them? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, interviews are a little bit daunting, but I think um, when you get to the interview stage, that means that you've done something right. And so that's when it seems as though schools really want to get to know who you are. Um, so just for, for full transparency, the schools that I got interviews at were the University of Miami Medical School, Rush Medical College, um, George Washington and UC Irvine, and not one of those schools had an MMI. And so I really can't speak to what an MMI is, but generally it seems as though they give you some cases like an ethical case and they'll give you like a minute or two to answer it and then they'll give you a few more of those and they want to see how you respond on the spot 
Um, most of my interviews were traditional interview style, which is where I'm just sitting and I'm chatting with you and they have a chance to ask you questions. And at the end, you have a chance to ask them questions. And for those, um, it was either with a student or a faculty member. So not only did I speak to doctors, but I also for UC Irvine spoke to a first year medical student. And I think I am now an interviewer for UC Irvine and I love to meet pre-meds and what I'm interviewing people, what I look for is like genuine passion. And if you're going to tell me your whole story, and I know it's kind of hard to like tell your story to someone you just met, met, but just know that like we're trying to under, understand who you are, what you want to do as a physician and why you're here. Um, and it's just kind of important to put all those cards out on the table. Um, let's see. And I think when you're preparing for medical school interviews, my first recommendation, I will rarely recommend this, but go to Student Doctor Network and search up what like the school will have an interview page where students who have previously interviewed will write what was asked of them. I would practice those exact questions because for some of the schools, not naming schools, some of the questions were exactly the same. And then um, I would make sure to definitely do a mock interview, whether that's with someone, I know that's expensive, or by yourself, you just take a video of yourself talking and you listen to it back because you're not used to hearing your voice and you might have some weird quips that you don't realize until you hear it. So I had to do this a lot. I took a lot of videos of myself talking and answering questions while I was driving to work. I would do a little voice memo and um, I realized that I said like a lot and I really wanted to cut that out. And when I took videos of myself, I realized I tilted my head to the side a lot, which I wanted to cut out. So that would generally be my advice. Uh, and if you're able to, just see if you can contact a medical student at that school and have them ask questions to you and learn, truly learn why you want to go to that school because that passion is very evident when people interview for UC Irvine, whether or not they did research into the school. Um, so yeah, do your research and be yourself. They're gonna love you. Perfect. Yeah, that that interview is so important because it's not just about getting to the interview, but it's also about really showcasing who you are during it, whether it's the MMI format, whether it's the standard interview. And also you mentioned UC Irvine. Last year when we did the pre-med experience 2023, one of our deans panelists was actually one of the deans at UC Irvine, who is Dr. Megan Boyce and Osborne. So great little connection right there. Um, but really kind of showing who you are is more than just about rehashing your, your activities. It's really about expressing to the interviewer all about yourself and why you want to become a physician. Um, we have time for a few more questions. So the next one I'm going to kind of combine into one question to Clara, which is about some of the tactics that are involved. And so you know, people are writing here, it's difficult to find somebody to shadow, which is definitely true at times. It's difficult to get in touch with somebody who can pretty much allow you to be a part of their research, like a principal investigator. What are some of those tactics, Claire, that you use to get in contact with people? Is it just cold emails? Is it persistence and following up? How did you sort of navigate finding people to shadow, finding people to do research with and other activities that you might have done? Definitely. And it's hard, especially to, I'm, none of my family members are physicians, so I'm the first one to be at medical school. So I don't have any of these existing connections. Part of what I did was really leverage my friends who were juniors and seniors at my university who were also pre-med, maybe already got accepted to medical school and asked which physicians or research labs they joined who were have already worked with pre-medical students and used that as a starting off point. I also did a summer research opportunity back home at WashU, and there was a physician who I shadowed there and did research with and tried to network with them. And many physicians, they know other physicians too in different specialties. So I'd also ask them, is there any other um, physician you could connect me with in dermatology, for example, because I was interested in learning more about that. So leveraging your existing connections. And if there's a pre-med organization that you're a part of, sometimes they have like resources of all the physicians that people have shadowed in the past. And that's also a great resource as well. So those in addition to kind of cold emailing and stuff like that, which definitely can be a little discouraging sometimes. And you just need to be persistent as well. One email isn't going to do it. Sometimes even as a medical student, I have to email my PI two or three times before they get, get back to me because they're just so busy and their inboxes are always full. Um, and sometimes if it 
is conducive, maybe even just going to the practice in person, introducing yourself and seeing if you could find some time to speak with people who work there or the physician that's there. Perfect. Um, I, I know that we have so many questions. We only have a few more minutes. So I want to make sure that in the chat, we're going to write how to get in contact with these awesome panelists on social media for additional questions. And we're going to try to answer the ones in the Q&A afterwards via email. Um, but we have time for this one last question that I want everybody to answer too. So we'll, in, in about a minute or less, um, I'm going to ask each one of you, starting with Misha, you know, for someone who's sitting here watching, what is the single biggest takeaway that you want to give to somebody who's here right now, who's a pre-med, who wants to become a physician, who wants to be in your shoes in medical school? What's the biggest piece of advice in one minute or less? We're going to go through everybody. And that's the last question. You got it. Okay. Don't give up. Do not give up. Even if you don't get in this cycle, even if you don't get in next cycle, it does not matter. Keep pushing at this. This is a hard process. The fact that you guys have taken the time out of your day to be here. You've put in so much energy into your education and you're doing what needs to be done to get where we are. You will make it. So don't put unnecessary pressure on yourself. Just understand that your time is going to come and keep pushing. Being a pre-med is one of the hardest parts, I will say. Um, and you guys are doing excellent. The fact that you're here today is incredible. And I'm proud of each and every single one of you. Great. Um, Megan? Okay. You said one minute and I got so, I felt so much pressure, but basically I think everyone's going to hear this from, it's like the most basic piece of advice, but don't compare yourself to other people. Whenever I first started college, people were talking about volunteering at the nearby hospital hospital. And I was like, okay, when did y'all even, when did y'all even interview to get that spot? Like, I didn't even know there were applications for this. And so that was, you know, it felt really weird starting college off like that, but I eventually got all my clinical stuff. I did perfectly fine. And same for medical school. When you get here, there's people going to be bragging about research, about shadowing and, you know, like just block them all out, block out the haters, block out the non-haters, block out whoever, and just focus on yourself and your journey and what you yourself are interested in. Find your mentors, find your people, and you will be fine. Thank you so much, Claire. Yeah, this is all great advice. I was like trying to think of something different. Um, but somebody commented this quote on one of my posts and it was like, closed mouths don't get fed. And I really love the idea behind that. And I definitely think I utilize that many times throughout my pre-med journey because I didn't have any physician connections at the time and I always needed to reach out to other people for help and cold email and same thing when you're applying to medical schools and if you're waitlisted or if you haven't gotten an interview yet send a letter of interest tell the med schools that you're interested in them and leverage your existing acceptances to maybe get scholarships at other schools like the worst thing that people can do is either ignore you like not see your email or say no and it can't hurt to ask and definitely being able to reach out and put myself out there has helped me get to med school now awesome and now the last one is for sana Wow, you guys said everything perfectly. Um, I just want to reiterate that there are people that are rooting for you. We don't know you individually, but we're rooting for you. There are free resources out there. There are mentors out there. Please take advantage of that. You are doing so much and being such a go-getter by being on this panel today. You're being a go-getter with every email that you send, even if someone doesn't respond. And I think that this med school app journey is so hard when it's hard, remind yourself that it's supposed to be hard. You're not supposed to be handling it perfectly. It's not going to be easy. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so yeah, we're just all really proud and excited of you. So keep doing your thing. Keep showing up and tell your story authentically. And whatever brought you to medicine is what's meant to get you into medicine. Those were such fantastic answers. This was clearly so helpful. Uh, we really want to thank all the panelists for being on today, for taking time out of your weekend to help answer direct questions. Uh, we got through so many questions. Obviously, everyone is going to be following you on social media and asking more. Um, this was just an incredible, incredible panel. Thank you all so much.